I want to ask a, a question again tonight that I ask often, and I ask it, I ask it of myself too. How many people up until right now, how many people up until right now, you and I have made a distinct difference in their life? God has used us to make a distinct difference in the life of somebody else, man, woman, boy, girl, whoever, whatever. Every one of us as believers should leave something behind for others. Now, I could uh, just go right down the row again, and I could mention the names of men that made a difference in my life. I would not be in this pulpit tonight if it was not for Wayne Williams and, and some other pastors that took time for me, a country boy. And I want to, and this is not bragging, and you're not bragging when you say this. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, I want to hear the Lord say, well done. And I want him to be able to point out the people, some of the people that my, maybe God had used me uh, to make a difference in their lives. And to hear the Lord say, well done. Well done. Do you know that I believe this is going to happen when we get to heaven? You that have supported missionaries all of these years through our church. When you get to heaven and the judgment seat of Christ is over and we're going into our routine, if you will, not a routine, but you know what I'm saying, there's going to be people that will come up to you and they may say something like this, you went to Gospel Light Baptist Church, didn't you? Thank you. I have been born again because a missionary and you supported him came to my home and led me to the Lord. Wouldn't that be a great thing for you as an individual and for me as an individual, but then as a church? Think of the differences that Brother Jesse's mom and dad has made on the foreign field where they are. Can you imagine how God has blessed them and so forth? And so they're going to have rewards there. Sometimes I just don't think that we think about that very much. We're so engulfed in what we do every day. We get so engulfed about these little, little petty things. And there's nothing wrong with playing a game of golf or going to a ball game. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'll say this. If we could just think serious about the matter, I want to leave something behind. Now, are you a leader? Are you a leader or a follower? We need followers. We need leaders. But the book of Proverbs talks about how you can become a leader. Doesn't matter what age group you fall into. Doesn't matter uh, where you live in, in, in life or in, in the world. You can become a leader. Now let me just mention uh, these initiatives for a leader real quick and just think about them. First of all, a leader, listen now, a leader takes the initiative. We need men and women that will take the initiative. They'll not just back away and say, well, I don't know. I'll try, but I, I don't know. Well, find out what your gifts are. Find out what the gifts that God has given you. Find out what they are and get in the Bible, pray, and let him use you and use those gifts. And that's what you will answer to in heaven is those gifts that God has given you. He's not going to ask you to do something that another man could do that's gifted for it or a woman could. And he's not going to do that. But what he has gifted you with is what you're going to answer for. Let's go to the other direction for just a moment. How many men has shut down a church because they wanted to run it? I know churches in the country where women want to run the church and the church doors were closed. Oh, they took the initiative all right and they took the initiative and the church closed down. And I've seen that in the country. I've seen that in the country over and over and over again. I remember after I'd answered the call to preach and, and was preaching at Pleasantdale, some of the churches in the area, country churches, heard that I had answered the call to preach. They knew me. They knew Dad. And so they asked, uh, they would ask me to preach. And I would go and I would preach and I got man, an opportunity to preach. Well, after the service, somebody would take me out to eat. And we'd get to, to the restaurant and we'd be sitting down and 
either the man or the woman or whoever it was will begin to download me with uh, their criticism of the pastor. Of course, I was so young, I didn't know how to handle that, 18, 19 years old. And they were just tearing the church down. Those people will answer to God for that. They'll answer to God for that. Now, they may have taken the initiative in leadership, but it was the wrong kind of leadership. Here in Proverbs, we have the right kind of leadership, positive leadership that's mentioned here. But you think about this. A leader takes the initiative. Let's go, guys. Let's go. Remember back in the days of World War II, some of you do, and they would uh, give uh, excerpts of what was going on the, on the battlefield, and they would mention a, a sergeant or a major or a lieutenant that just stood out. He and his brigade did more to push back the enemy because they were ready. They took the initiative. They knew what to do. They didn't run. See what I'm getting at? And God needs those kind of people in, in our churches, this church and other churches. A leader takes the initiative. Then a leader uses good judgment. Always use good judgment. I never will forget one day our tractor had broke down and uh, I came up to where Dad was and I was behind him on, the, uh, on another one and came up and uh, I had not worked on, the, on a tractor. I had used it, but I hadn't worked much on it, the batteries and all that kind of stuff. And Dad was looking, looking at it and I was saying, Dad, what are, you, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to find out what's wrong with the, with the engine here. And I watched him and I found out that he was a man that took the initiative and he was a man that used good judgment. He didn't just come in there and tear the tractor apart. I've seen mechanics who just take a car apart and then they don't know how to put it back together. Hmm? Some Christians do that. They don't know how to take the initiative. Uh, they don't use sound judgment. And then a leader speaks with authority. Now he's not mean-spirited, but when he speaks, people know that he knows what he's talking about. He's proved himself in the battle. See, we need to prove ourselves in the battle. And of course, pastors have different battles than others, and yet, and on and on, missionaries have different battles than others, so to speak. And so here we need to be the kind of a leader that's using good judgment. Then, a good leader strengthens others. A good leader strengthens others. Now, once again, I want to press this down, home. You have gifts God's given you. I, I just pray that everybody in here know what your gift or gifts are and you're using them. He wants you to find your gift and he wants you to use it while you're here on this earth. Think with me for a moment. Use your spiritual imagination for just a moment. It's the judgment seat of Christ. It's, it's come. The judgment seat of Christ has come. The saints are home, and now they're standing at the judgment seat of Christ to give an account to the Lord for what we did in the body, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And the Lord will be looking right at us. And you know you can't hide anything. He knows it all. He knows you, your upcoming and your downsettings and your outgoings and your incoming. All of, He knows it all. He knows it all. And then all of that will be laid out before us. The things we did that were, that were powerful and used to help other people and the things that we did to hurt others. All that's going to be there and we're going to answer to it. Wouldn't it be a great thing if, if you could just uh, have it in your mind and your heart because you were, you were faithful that you were going to hear the Lord say, well done, well done. Enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. We'll lay our, at his feet. Our, I'm trying, I can't think of the word, but we'll lay them at, at his feet. Amen? And we'll be rewarded for that, and some will suffer loss. I want to be amongst that group that took the initiative, that wanted to help other people. I wanted to help others. And then the next thing, a leader takes an optimistic approach. He takes an optimistic approach, an enthusiastic approach. 
Uh, Robert, uh, would you, I know, I know you're busy, and, and I know that you don't like to do things like this, but could I, would, would I, could I ask you to help me do this? Well, Robert's going to stand up and say, why, yes, sir, you're such a leader, I want to follow you. No, he wouldn't say that. Uh, amen? And so we want people in the service of God that is, uh, he strengthens others, he's uh, optimistic and enthusiastic. And then a leader never compromises absolutes. A loser, ne a winner never, never compromises absolutes. And then a leader focuses on the objectives, on the objectives, not the obstacles. You know, some people, they keep their eye on the obstacles all the time. That's all they look at. They, well, look at this, look at this. How did this happen? No, forget about that. Get in there and get it done. And then a leader leads by example. A leader leads by a powerful example. Now, I know you hear me talk about Tennessee Temple and uh, the years that I was there, but I can't help it. I, I learned much just by being there. I mean, just by being there, I would have learned a valuable, uh, some valuable information just by sitting there rather than being a, a student and going through the, uh, the uh, moves, uh, the classes and so forth and so on. But I learned something. Now, let me just say this, and you've heard me say it. When it came time for to start the services, Dr. Robertson was a very busy man, and so we'd be standing up singing. The auditorium would be filled with men and women getting ready for the ministry, getting ready for, uh, to be a pastor, getting ready to go to the, to, to the mission field. And Dr. Robertson walked to that, po that podium, walked back behind the man leading the singing right beside Dr. J.R. Faulkner, and you just knew that a man of God had stepped to the podium. Now, I don't know how to explain that to you. He was a man that made, could make decisions just like that. He was a man that wanted to, what was right, to be right and stay right. I watched him chew some guys out because they did some things that they should never have done. And he said, you're going home for the rest of the semester. Now, if you want to come back, and then he went into all of that, but he just, in front of the whole group, and he said, you men need to learn a lesson. And I remember the next, the next semester, they came back, and the Lord, or doctor, he let him come in, and they graduated. But a man that knew how to lead stood and he led. A leader empowers by example, and then I like this one, and should be. A leader, a man of God, a woman of God, cultivates loyalty, but a leader empathizes with others. A leader empathizes with others. You know, here's a man or a woman, they really want to serve God. They really do. But there is a physical problem. Or maybe a problem at home. What, you know what I'm talking about. And so uh, we need people to help others that are going through some hard times. And then lastly, a leader has a clear conscience. A leader has a clear conscience. Now let's go back to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. We talked about this morning the purpose of the book of Proverbs. And then we went down in chapter 1 and down in verse uh, 6. And notice what he says. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. And then he says in verse 7, watch this now. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So in the book of Proverbs, a practical book, you have the warnings against violence. You go down to chapter, or you go down to verse uh, 20, and notice it says, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. The results of rejecting wisdom, that's what you find there. Then you go down to verse uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, watch. My son, if thou will receive my words, and hide my commandments with thee. 
that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her with hid treasures, and he goes on. God rewards wisdom. He's given us his book. He's given us the privilege of prayer. He's given us men and women that know how to rightly divide the word of truth. And so he will use us in a mighty way. I talk about Brother Jesse and his dad an awful lot, but his daddy and his mother went to the mission field. And they did a great work. They're still there and still doing a great work. You know why? Because they're, they're a man and woman of God that has listened to the Lord. You see what I'm saying? And can you just imagine when those two stand before the Lord and he says, well done. And we'll be there to see that. And we'll be so thrilled, I know, because of that. Now just quickly over in uh, chapter 3. Now, we've talked about several things, and, I, and just notice now the blessings of wisdom. The blessings of wisdom. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep thy commandments for length of days and long life. Now, listen to what he's saying here. The matter of long life, he says. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep thy, my commandments for length of days and long life, and peace shall they add to thee. Did you see that? Now, don't, of course, don't answer me out loud, but every one of us has found ourselves in situations where we've made some pretty bad mistakes. And because of those mistakes, others were hurt, maybe in the church or somewhere. That's, a, that's not a good feeling, is it? You know why? Because the Lord's going to chasten you. He's going to chase us. He's going to speak to our heart. And so we need men and women that will keep God's law. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Now watch this. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. I read those this morning, but I'm reading them again for a reason. I want to drive it home to myself, and I want to drive it home to you. How much time do we have left on this earth? We don't know. We don't know. We may live several years. We may live only a few years. We could be in a situation where very little food is rationed out. That could happen. It's happened before. It could happen again. And so forth. So we need to be ready. Verse 5 and verse 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Isn't that a great thought? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. And I love this. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct. He will direct thy path. And I could just read on. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now, let me spend just a little time. I'm not going to keep you much longer, but I want you to go back to uh, chapter 2 with me. Let me read uh, once again here in chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 6. I think I, I want us to just really get this uh, in our mind and in our thinking, the reward of wisdom. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou... Christ after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth, cometh knowledge and understanding, and layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk up rightly. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we started with this matter of how to know God's will for your life. 
And I know that we spent some time this morning, we're spending some time tonight, but this is something that's very, very, very important. Now, God loves you. God loves me. You do believe that, don't you? How many of you really believe God loves you and cares for you? Of course you do. And he wants to use you for his glory. He wants to say to you, well done. He wants that for you. He wants that for me. I don't know how it's going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. I, I, don't, I don't know. But I know one thing. <clears throat> I want to hear him say, well done. Well done. So we need to think about every day when we rise that that day could be today. All right, now think about this. As you study your Bible, when you were born into this world, God knew you were going to be born into the world. He knew I was going to be born into the world. And before we were even born, the Bible teaches that he has a wonderful plan for my life even before I was born. Now you think about that. Do you realize that God has always existed? He never, has never had a beginning. He'll never have an ending. Can you imagine that? Go back 790 billion years. God was there. Think about that figure in the future. He's going to be there, and so will you and I. Can you imagine that? 20,000 years from now, you're going to be alive and we're going to be loving, serving the Lord in, in heaven. We're going to enjoy being with one another. Heaven's going to be a wonderful time and it, we're going to be there without end, without, without any interruption from Satan, without any horror, none of that. Because the Lord has a wonderful plan for us. But there's a lot of Christians that's going to miss it. They're not going to miss heaven. They'll be there. But they're going to miss that well done. They're going to miss that well done. Won't that be a sorrowful state? Here you stand before the Lord Jesus that loved you enough to die for you. But you turned away. You, you, you went to church and all that kind of thing. A wonderful plan for my life. A wonderful plan for your life. And he wants to use this church. And he wants to use you. Now, find God's will for your life. If you've not found what his will for your life is, find it. He'll be happy to show it to you. He'll be happy to show it to you. And he wants to use you. So find his will and live according to it. Now let me just give you one thought now and uh, say just a few little things and then we'll go home. Uh, I think I gave you this uh, before but I want to uh, go back and uh, just rehearse some of these things. Number one, the need to know God's will. We need to know God's will for our life. There's that great need to know what his will is. Because if I know what his will is, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste my time. You know, when Dad and I were working on that tractor, when Dad opened up that tractor's engine and began to work on it, he said, wait a minute, Bob. He said, I want to show you what I'm doing. I want to show you how to take an engine, to get, uh, take an engine down and put it back together. And he said, you need to know all of that. And then he taught me some other things on, on the farm. You see what I'm saying? The Lord wants to teach you and I. We need to know his will. What happens to people who never find God's will for their life? Well, they're going to be messed up. Now, they might make a lot of money. Are you listening? They may make a lot of money. They may live in a big home. They may have all kinds of massive cars, but they've messed up. They may have all kind of foolish lifestyles, but just wait till the judgment seat. When a little mother that brought up her children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and taught them, that little mother is going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and be rewarded over and over and over again for her faithfulness. And this big man that knew all these things will have nothing but just be in heaven. I don't want to just be in heaven, do you? 
I want to hear the Lord say, well done, and I want to have a grand time uh, in that place. But I don't want to have a messed up life. The, the devil wants your life messed up. Secondly, messed up marriages. In these years of counseling, I've dealt with a lot of men and women that went through divorce and so forth and so on. And I'm happy to say that several of them came back together and lived their uh, a great lives together as husbands and wife. And that just was a thrilling thing for me to see that. Uh, and I, I was so happy for that. So human experience will tell us that we need God's blessings. Uh, we don't want to have our lives messed up. We don't want to have our family life messed up. We don't want to have unhappy personalities. Don't you just love a grouch? <laughs> okay, I'll take that back. But we can mess our lives up, can't we? And I don't know about you, but I, I love life enough that I want to I wanna go out loving it because I know I've got something far greater on the other side. Amen? So the first thing I want you to write down is need to know God's will. We'll move forward with that a little bit again uh, next week, and then we'll look at finding God's will. How do you do it? Okay? Let's stand, and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Don't forget to pray for one another now, and pray that the Lord will watch over us and protect us and will keep us safe. Pray for those that... Uh, They've had uh, deaths in the family. The family has had a, uh, one that's left us. And even though they're saved, that still leaves an emptiness for a while. But thank God, born again, we'll see them again. Amen? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. All right, let's pray. Brother Bo, will you dismiss us, please? Thank you.